In South Africa too, phobia about foreigners, above all foreigners from elsewhere in Africa, has been the offspring of the fledgling democracy, growing alongside appeals to Ubuntu, which is a common African humanity. In the 1990s, that phobia congealed into an active antipathy to what was perceived to be a shadowy alien nation of illegal immigrants. And illegal goes together with immigrant in the same way that alien goes together plant here. Invasive, as it were, um, in the same way that the plants were. Popularly held to be economic vultures, and here I'm quoting from the popular press, who usurp jobs and resources, who bring crime and disease. These anti-citizens were accused, in an uncanny analogy with these alien plants, of spreading uncontrollably and of siphoning off the wealth of the nation. Aliens, then, are a distinctive species in the popular imagination. In what is a distressing parody of apartheid practice, they are profiled by colour and culture, thence to be excluded from the moral community. And again, I remind you of District 9. Once singled out, illegals are seldom differentiated from bona fide immigrants. All are dubbed makwerequere, which is a term for incompetent speech. Not surprisingly, most immigrants are very afraid of speaking in public for that reason, because they're afraid they'll be detected. Now, their fear is well founded. With the relaxing of controls over immigrant labour, South Africa, which after all is Africa's America, has become the destination of choice for many people from the north. Estimates run as high as 8 million. This influx has occurred amidst changes in the domestic economy that have altered relations of labour to capital, leading to a radically downsized job market and an over 80% uh, um, uh, uh, opting for what is called non-standard labour, that is the kind of labour contracts that supported communities in the past of almost disappeared. The labour is often done by lowly paid illegal immigrants, whom farmers and industrialists insist are essential to their survival in a competitive global market. Small wonder then that getting hold of the alien, whose cut and body the threat in popular minds to work and welfare, began to emerge as a popular mode of confronting economic marginalisation and this popular in this effort to try and regain a sense of community. And so the stage was set. In 2008, amidst sharply increasing unemployment and rising food prices and growing discontent about the lack of housing and promised services, violent attacks were unleashed against foreigners, first around Johannesburg, then across the land. I quote, troops called out as South Africa burns, screamed the local press, fire again, while media across the world bore graphic images of property torch and people attacked. Fire and aliens again. Young men armed with sticks took to streets to purge their neighbourhoods of foreigners, and these strangers were dragged from their homes amidst friendlies, frenzied accusations that they'd stolen jobs, that they'd undercut the minimum wage, that they'd usurped scarce housing, that they spread AIDS. The ethnic profile of these victims showed some predictability. Zimbabweans who fled in large numbers from their troubled homeland were the most likely victims nationwide. But the identity of the scapegoats also varied with local sociology. In each case, the designated alien served as the other yeah. for a desperate effort to try and draw a line, if you like, that separated the citizen from the outsider. And realized a kind of citizenship that had long been promised but still was felt to be denied. Through all this, the state remained an ambiguous actor. On the one hand, it joined outraged voices at home and abroad, condemning the attacks and insisting on respect for universal human rights. On the other, it was slow to respond to the ethno-national violence. Furthermore, while it engaged in pious condemnation of the savages who were xenophobic, it was conspicuously silent on the desperate social conditions and sense of neglect that had set the scene for this brutal drama. The regime has also contributed to the logic of xenophobia by, under, by permitting its police, um, with their effectiveness ever more uh, caught in question, to wage visible war on the foreign specter in high-profile high raids of immigrant neighbourhoods. Such tactics have been accompanied by official announcements of U.S. bids to rid South Africa of illegal aliens. Now, reference to the U.S. style of alien management is telling. Here in the U.S. too, there have been shows of decisive action in the face of the immigrant problem. 
that exist alongside an almost farcical legal paralysis on the issue at a national level. It remains a real and a problem debating the point of the US too. Here too, a history of official double speak makes it plain how acutely the problem concerns the paradox of borders, how it highlights the contradiction between sovereignty and deregulation, neoconservatism and neoliberalism, national protectionism and the globalized division of labor. In the US too, spectacles of enforcement serve as attempts to redress the anomaly of strangers who become essential to domestic life and reproduction, who mix intimate local knowledge with what we sometimes suspect of foreign loyalties, raising spectres of crime that links to terror, who are simultaneously indispensable to us and yet disposable, visible yet invisible, inside and beyond the law. In June, June 2007, for example, and I'll quote here um, from the New York Times, dozens of armed immigrant agents supported by local police in right here stormed a meatpacking factory in Greeley, Colorado, one of five spontaneous well-publicized raids on similar facilities across the nation. Term Operation Wagon Train, these raids were, were, were claimed by the U.S. Homeland Security and Immigration um, as a victory, a blow against illegal immigration. But the reports were, were made plain that many of these deported workers were back within a week. Their labor, like that of the estimated 12 million other undocumented workers, seems indispensable to our industry, agriculture, and service sector. And this is evidence of exactly the set of impasse of boundary maker that I've mentioned earlier that we witnessed in the South African case. In the US, observes Gary Young, the political border is no longer coterminous with the physical borders of the nation. The de facto border is now more a matter of economic expediency uh, than a matter of law and order. It crisscrosses the country, mobilizing ethnic profiles and securing the homeland it, by dividing nationals from aliens, wherever they might be. And borders are at airports, at various points where there are raids and so on. Now, shades here are the kind of contingency we identified at the outset that was characteristic of the newer polity and of Schmittian philosophy. Newer polities, recall, lacked fixed, firm geographical borders and boundaries. Boundaries between the inside and outside were set up in the very process of dealing with the things that transgressed them. We see here. For Schmidt, the essential political gesture lay in drawing the line, indeed making life and death distinctions between friend and enemy, which is exactly what happens when aliens in South Africa are either flushed out by the police with little attention to their legal rights or attacked by, by mobs of unemployed locals. It's also what happens here when would be illegal migrants may be apprehended not only at the points of entry into the country but anywhere that their dis difference comes to light, anywhere that lines seem to be crossed, anywhere that they may be reported on by non-citizens, by our citizens, sorry, so the non-citizens reported on by citizens. Note in this regard that Operation Wagon Train is no arbitrary term of phrase. It's reference to the conquest of the Wild West frontier, a process incidentally that made America's first autochthons into aliens, reveals a deeper truth. It returns us here, like elsewhere, to a language of state-making as a kind of colonial heroics, in which, as one anti-immigrant group put it, citizens' control is in need of re-establishment. Seen in this light, armed raids on migrant enclaves might not seal the border, they don't succeed in doing that, but they do create an impression of effectiveness on the part of the state in a political context in which illusion has become as important as reality. Here, in short, is an instance of the kind of mass mediated excess that I mentioned before, directed at producing state power and securing sovereignty in the current age. Now, a few concluding remarks. 